I invite you to come to our exhibit. And the reason I do that is because we have started to increase our investments in research and development in an accelerated and a unique way. We have formed a, a special and, uh, I believe, unique and, and very, very enjoyable relationship with the American Academy of Periodontology. And I think we are uh, the only diamond member. And uh, I remember years ago, there used to be gold, silver, and bronze. Now it's platinum, gold, silver, bronze. And we're diamond, platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. I'm working my way up to titanium. <laughs> so uh, welcome to all of you. And uh, it is a great pleasure for me to uh, see you all today and to speak with you for a few minutes. I have double duty. I am your lead speaker and I'm also be your moderator for today. And what I would like to speak with you about in the initial session is our concepts regarding health and aesthetics around implants. And if we take a look at what we're traditionally engaged in as periodontists is dentitions that are compromised due to attachment loss. But we have to ask ourselves a question. We can take dentitions like this and we can facilitate regenerative attempts and we can transform these patients from a uh, diseased, and attachment loss status with aesthetic compromises and create for our restorative colleagues a partnership that would enhance their restorative care. Why is it that we can do this on a regular basis around natural teeth, but somehow we manage to uh, have in our minds that establishing aesthetic cases like this is more challenging around implants? So initially in our discussion, we're going to look at bone because bone is the one anatomic feature and the one tissue that will drive both health and aesthetics for our implants. If then we're saying that we're more dependent on bone, the more we depend on the placement of implants for both health and aesthetics, how then can we enhance the bony support and how then can we enhance this critical anatomic tissue for the support of implants and the support of soft tissue around implants. I'm going to concentrate for a moment on allografts because if you look at allografts and you look at the healing of autogenous bone and the healing of allografts, it is essentially the same. Autogenous cortical bone is not the gold standard. What is the gold standard is anterior, anterior iliac crest bone and marrow because it has osteogenic components within it. In orthopedics, healing with osseous union around bone allografts typically will occur between 40 and 60 weeks postoperatively. This is really in contrast to what we see happening in dentistry. We want things faster. We want the implants faster. We want the restoration faster. We want the function faster. Patients want it faster. What we really have to understand, what, we, what the real secret is going to be in the future, is how to enhance their healing capacities and speed their healing capacities for site regeneration and bone regeneration. Right now, we're stuck with the biology that the patient has. Now that we've established some of the aspects of health around implants that will affect our aesthetics, what about unhealthy sites? What about implants with peri-implant disease? Well, the American Academy of Periodontology has just published uh, a white paper on perimucositis and periimplantitis and represents a current understanding of their diagnosis and clinical implications. I have to tell you that this is an uncharted path and an unbelievable opportunity for periodontists. You are uniquely equipped to manage periimplant disease based on your ability to manage chronic inflammation and based on your ability to regenerate bone and soft tissue. I would encourage you to go to perio.org, download this document, and share it with your restorative colleagues because it lays out for them and their hygienists how to diagnose perimucositis, periimplantitis, the importance of radiographs, and the importance of partnering with a periodontist early on in discovery of these diseases. My dear colleagues, it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be here to, today and to share with you some, uh, some uh, knowledge or data about uh, uh, perio at implants and per perhaps to bring 
the world from Europe here in the uh, in, uh, in US. I don't know if, if we have the truth. Uh, I, th I think we have one uh, vision of, of things, and I would like to share that uh, with you today, and it's my pleasure. You know what is the biological width? The establishment of this biological width is the establishment of, of a seal, an adhesion of the junctional epithelium, and an adhesion of the connective tissue. It's a three millimeter wide seal to isolate and protect the bone from the external environment. This particle width is mandatory. We have to protect the bone. Otherwise, of course, you will have a migration of the epithelium and an expulsion of the, of the implant at the end. So this biological width is mandatory. And unfortunately, it can only happen and, 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 and form on biocompatible materials. If the trans co transmucosal component is non-biocompatible, uh, if it is slightly toxic, then of course you cannot have a junctional epithelium. What's the difference? On the left side, I placed the implant and we immediately placed a zirconia abutment at the time of the surgery, an immediately progenital crown, and the zirconia abutment was never disconnected. So we had an adhesion, and there we kept a perfect bone level. On the right side, what happened? I sent back the patient to the referring dentist, and she placed short titanium tubes, one millimeter, with resin, resin, uh, yes, resin uh, provisional crowns um, that is at least five to six millimeters subgingivally in the proximal areas. No adhesion possible, so it means that the junctional epithelium has to migrate apically and we lose bone. Same implant, not the same procedure, just a problem of biocompatibility. What is mostly, oh, most probably more important is to have a fibrous tissue attached to the bone, lab, to the bone tissue underneath. That is a very stable tissue, a mechanically stable tissue. And very often this tissue is keratinized, but not always. So <coughs> this paper from Bury et and co-workers, for instance, there are several papers, show that uh, the gingival index, plaque index, bone loss and the bleeding were higher when the keratinized mucosa was below two millimeters. So to make a long story short, the wider the keratinized mucosa, the lower the bone loss and the better the soft tissue health. So we need at least ab about two millimeters of stable a fibrous tissue around our implants. Uh, I've had a long history with the rehabilitation of patients with dental implants and most of you in this room, some of you who started at the same time I did, will see a history here. My objectives today is to talk about three things. I want to talk about this treatment called All in Four as a concept of one of the non-grafted immediate loading protocols for dental patients. I want to visit the techniques and science behind the All in Four technique and I'd like to demonstrate patient acceptance and satisfaction. Uh, I don't do any of these surgeries unless they have been planned in a computer. If I can't do it in a computer, I can't do it in the mouth. We have the ability today with software to get a surgical roadmap with the patient. So we do scouting, we do planning. I have a 55 inch Samsung monitor in my surgical operatory. There's somebody who's here that's been in my office before. She's had surgery before. She knows exactly what goes on. There is a big picture. This isn't a Panorex with a line drawn on it. This is a three-dimensional representation of a surgical execution. I have a roadmap mentally in my mind before I ever treat a patient. Now, I have a prosthodontist, my best referral, best friend. Guess what he says to me? George, I love that design because I like the screw holes in the metal because I can unscrew the appliance and not screw up the appliance and tear up the acrylic. Because if those of you who have removed these know when you remove the composite, you shatter a little acrylic, the hole gets a little wider. So he wants me to put the implants in so the screw access hole, Barry, has to come out the lingual of that framework. Now, you know how you have that happen predictably? You don't. You're just having a good day. If all four holes come out in the metal, you're having a good day, unless you're doing this with guided surgery. Then it's predictable. So what we plan, and I still have a bias towards the Brandemark appliance because I have historical connection and it's worked very well for me in my practice, but in the maxilla, I'm gonna apply a different technique. I'm gonna apply the all-in-four technique for this patient, 
and sorry for this panorama, I don't know why it's not falling in there, but you would see all in four in the maxilla and five implants in the mandible. And we reconstructed him with zirconia framework and composite because this guy uses his teeth for a weapon. And I don't want to have teeth popping off all the time. So he wears the composite uniformly. It's easy to repair. I've only had to repair it once in three years. Add a little composite on it, smooth it, and he's out the door. So it's very easy to repair. And is he happy? He's thrilled that he doesn't have to deal with these teeth anymore because his teeth were a nightmare for him. So he started there. He ends up there. How long did that surgical appointment take? One visit. All the teeth were edentulated. The veloplasty was done. The implants were placed. And a conversion prosthesis was placed at the time of surgery. So what's my final thoughts? Here we are. We're in Philadelphia, the home of our country. And here we are as a profession. We're still making dentures. Branham Mark said it to me at his birthday party in 2009, directly to me. We were talking about this. He says, I want you to go out and help make procedures simple and reliable. This particular procedure that we're talking about is a simple, reliable, predictable procedure as demonstrated in the literature and in my own personal hands. If you look at the literature summaries, there are long-term 10-year results in the mandible, five years in the maxilla, high clinical survival rates. It can be performed with different concepts, noble guide. The bone looks good for the tilted and axial implants and the soft tissue, which we're talking about here again, can be managed very effectively for these implants to prevent those type of problems. What I see as the challenge is not whether or not this works. What I see the challenge for you to go back into your practice is how do you logistically deliver this in your practice to your patients? This is a logistic problem, not a treatment problem. Focus on these patients. In my community, if you want an anterior single tooth implant immediately, that's what they come to me for and the other people know that I focus on total edentulous solutions of which all in four is one of the portfolios that I have in my pocket that I can use for these particular patients. So when we think about a, uh, a recipe for immediate implant surgery, I can tell you that there is no universal recipe that will meet each and every case. We've been talking about immediate implant surgery now for 20 years, and it still is one of the most controversial subjects in the transition of teeth to implants. <laughs> that implant placement is the least invasive, most predictable means of tooth replacement. And when a patient is subjected to a treatment sequence that is protracted, that doesn't make them whole in any quick suitable means, and the dentist doesn't have the means to solve the prosthetic dilemma, more than likely this case ends up with a three unit bridge. In my practice, this is a common transition day in and day out, and we've developed a relationship with our general dentists that if they have a patient in the office at that time and they see a problem, they can call us and we'll either get the patient in that day or the next day. One of the unique benefits of immediate implant surgery is that it, it can accomplish site retention and development with one surgical procedure. If you're going to be doing these type of procedures, you must have the full armamentarium of Noble BioCare lengths and sizes because you really don't know what size is coming in next. How about this case? Swollen, pus, and now we're going to place two implants so we can compare the healing in an intact site, which is the edentulous site number 30, to an immediate infective site, which is site number 31. And as we take a look at this case, a nine-year post-op, you see beautiful healing in both clinical situations, showing that there really is no difference in what you can accomplish with immediate implant placement or in an intact site, and the soft tissue development is magnificent. So that the unique benefits of immediate implants are that you can place an implant into an infective extraction socket once fully debrided, 
And this does not interfere with bone regeneration. On the contrary, these, cell, these sites which bleed so profusely actually add to the healing potential and they do not reduce the predictability. So that when we think about the implications, perhaps implants are the new perio in advanced clinical situations. They certainly quickly resolve periodontal issues, allowing for regeneration of the lost bone and a stable, steady state of bone. It's been a fabulous forum. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And thank you to the panel and Noble BioCare for running this. I would like to toast Nobel for their generous support of the AAP and the friendships we've had this year. Thank you. We would like thank to toast you. the uh, members of the uh, American Academy of Periodontology. Good thank friends you. and thank you. Thank you.